You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and to join our book club, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio, where we keep that tradition alive by showcasing an author with a French connection in each episode. Every episode will feature five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. Would you like to join the Storytime in Paris book club? Head on over to patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio and stay tuned to the end of this episode for more information. My guest this week is Sarah Horowitz, professor of history at WNL University, where she is also head of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program. Her latest novel is The Red Widow, the so insane it's nearly unbelievable true story of Marguerite Meg Staniel. In her lifetime, Meg was a high society socialite, a sex worker, a presidential mistress, and maybe, just maybe, a murderer. Please allow me to introduce Sarah Horowitz, author of The Red Widow. Hello, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on your show. So, Sarah, can you start off by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I am a professor of history. I teach at WNL University in Virginia, and I am also the author of The Red Widow, um, which just came out, which is a book about a very, very femme fatale woman in the late 19th and early 20th century. Yes, but this is a true story of this crazy woman. Yes, it is true. I spent years researching it, and I do not have the creativity to write a novel. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I can only write history. This this is one of those stories where truth is stranger than fiction. Because I think if you wrote this as a fiction novel, it would be overwhelming. It would be. And it would not, it would be improbable. There's, you know, costumes and an outrageous anti-heroine and absurd lies and just sort of random details um, of the story. So her husband and mother are murdered. She's tied to the bed, you know, at some point during the attack, and she's tied by uh, to the bed by toe by toe, which just, you know, if I were to write that, people would be like, this does not make any sense. But yeah, that's that's what it was. Amazing. Do you yourself have a connection to Paris or to France? I do. Yeah. So I lived for about two years in Paris when I was researching my dissertation. And I was really sort of so lucky to live there. Um, I met my wife there. And then I have continued to go back um, for research trips or to do sort of bring students to do study abroad classes. So I feel enormously lucky that I've got to spend a lot of time in the country. So I have collected some questions for you. And the first and perhaps most obvious question is, how did you first learn about Meg and did her story just continue to blow your mind the more you read about it? Um, so the answer to the second question is yes, but let me get to the first question. So this is actually on one of my research trips to France about 10 years ago. I was on a tour of Père Lachaise Cemetery with some friends. And as we were passing by the tomb of Felix Vaux, the man who is president of France in the 1890s, our tour guide stopped and said, I got to tell you how he died. And that he died um, of like while he was having an assignation with his mistress. And then the tour guide said, but also a batch of years later, her husband and mother were murdered. And the tour guide strongly suggested that she had had something to do with it. And I thought this was totally improbable. So he didn't believe it at all, but I was curious. And so I started looking into sort of what I could find about this woman, Marguerite Stenow, who sort of was known by all of her friends um, and family members as Meg. And I found that he was telling the truth and that her story was just so wild. And then to get to that second question, the more I continued research, I just couldn't get over the fact that 
No one knew who the full truth. And that also, you know, so many parts of her life were just absolutely bananas. She lied. I think she blackmailed people. She might have poisoned some folks, but like light poisoning. Um, she <laughs> framed innocent individuals for murder. You know, so just she was a woman who broke every rule in the book. And I was really interested by the fact that she kind of got away with it in a lot of respects. And she's this like high society sex worker. Yes. Yeah. Which was also so interesting to me that she like has this facade that she maintains of bourgeois morality and that she's like a sort of proper woman of the French bourgeoisie. But she is trading sex for money. And she's really invested in maintaining that facade. And as a result, she actually earns a lot less money than she could have because she has to sort of come up with all these ways that she never handles the cash. But yeah, and so it's it's this really interesting sort of window into the Belle Epoque, this world where, you know, like elite women had much more freedom to sort of pursue affairs, but she really pushed it to the limit in a lot of ways. Did you get the sense when you were talking to your tour guide, I haven't done any informal polling myself, but do you have the sense that this, like parts of this story are in like the French common knowledge folklore? Yes. So certainly um, the death of Felix Faure, that sort of, if people know anything about him, it tends to be how he died. I think they're much less aware of her, the, her, the murders, which is was this huge scandal that for 18 months just absolutely preoccupied the French public and was, you know, kind of headlines all the time. So I think that she she sort of very much lives on in French memory, although there's so much that's not known about her. There's a very rich archival record, which, of course, other people have looked at, but they haven't really sort of necessarily drawn on it for um, works about her. Well, that leads me to my next question. Can you talk a little bit about the research that you did for this book? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she she wrote her memoirs, which is both they're both helpful and not helpful. They're very helpful often in uh, terms of her perspective, but they're also just lies, and they're super anti-Semitic, and they're um, they're often really boring. So, but sometimes it's very helpful for her perspective. There's also, you know, the case was covered really, really extensively in the press. So through that, I could follow the twists and turns of the case. Amazingly, I actually had dialogue from the time. Oh, wow. Yeah, sort of, you know, as she was speaking to various police officials about the murders. But another thing that came out in the reporting was there's a lot of reporting on all her affairs with men prior to the murders and you know her family life so there was this kind of that was a really rich source and then the third main source was the archival record which is the police's investigation into the murders of her husband and mother and they too there was a lot about you know the physical evidence and the crime scene um and her participation in the investigation but there was also a ton about her family background and you know about her affairs and you know the problem with all these sources is that none of them is they're not necessarily truthful meg was a woman she lied all her life she was very often lying to protect her reputation or make her seem more important the journalists of the time were often very sloppy with the facts and you know would sort of publish things that really were not true and then the archival sources too you know, sometimes they were constructed to make her look really good. And at other times they were constructed to make her look really bad. So I had to take everything with a grain of salt, which for a historian is maddening because you don't actually know what happened. But if there was something I kind of doubted, I would try and find another source that would validate it. Um, There's some things that I put in the book as just like, this is a rumor and it can't be true, but it's still super funny. So I was trying to kind of use the sources to see like, oh, is there, uh, you know, like evidence for this for like somewhere else? Or also sometimes I would have multiple versions of the same event, including from Meg herself. She would sort of tell the same story different ways. And in that case, it's like, okay, what is the most probable one? She seemed like she had a really unusual childhood. Like if you were just to present the book before the murders even happen, that book itself is already insane. 
Was her childhood as unusual as it seemed? I think in many ways it was. So she was born into one of France's great industrial dynasties, which again, at a certain level makes her unusual because she was born into this sort of very wealthy elite family. But her her sort of branch of the family were the black sheep because her father, when he was 26, no, when he was 28, sorry, he married a 16-year-old woman who was from a very humble background. And so this was very scandalous at the time. To us, the age difference is really, really scandalous. But to folks at the time, that the class difference was really scandalous, that the assumption was that he should have married someone from his own kind of elite status. And so they lived, uh, Meg and her siblings and her parents lived amongst the family in the same town, but I think they were always held apart. And then there were other elements of her background that were unusually quite unusual in a way that we would find a little bit troubling or a lot bit troubling. So her father clearly sort of took her as her favorite and she idolized her father, but he really, really sort of insisted that she learn from him how to be charming, how to be seductive, how to attract male attention. It sounds to me like sort of grooming, whether or not like he sexually assaulted her we don't know that, although there were certainly rumors at the time that he did. And her that sort of, certainly any degree of fatherly attention to his daughter's education was unusual. It was usually in the hands of the mother. But again, this this sort of, there were all these troubling undercurrents in the family. Um, her mother was quite passive and um, Meg really regarded her mother as in many ways very immature. But I think we could understand that Her father had never really allowed her mother to mature um, because of the sort of age gap in their marriage. And so she really always defined herself as someone who wanted to be the person that her father wanted her to be. So seductive, charming, energetic, full of life. And she would often define herself in opposition to her mother. She would would refuse to be passive. She wouldn't take no for an answer. And so I think that these, both the kind of class dynamics, but also the kind of really complicated and troubling emotional dynamics um, shaped her life in so many ways. Very interesting. This story takes place during the Belle Epoque in France. Mm -hmm. How much of the story do you think is a product of its time? Like, do you think a story like this could have happened at another point in history? Oh, that is such a great question. And I think it would be sort of, she was such a product of her time and it would be so hard to imagine her life as existing in any uh, sort of different context. So she lived in this world where, you know, sort of French elites were really strove to maintain a facade of respectability and sort of moral propriety in part to justify the fact that they monopolized political and economic power in France at the time, even though the country was, you know, officially democratic and had universal male suffrage. But in practice, they, you know, give themselves all sorts of license to misbehave as long as they can maintain that facade. And I think that sort of that really allowed her to pursue sex work to have affairs with men and maybe some women for money because there was a whole kind of world that was invested in, in some ways, keeping the secret, even as there was a lot of toleration for her behavior. I think certainly had she lived earlier in the 19th century, she her behavior would not have been tolerated and she would have been sort of outcast from high society as too kind of immoral And so I was also really interested in how much investment there was among the authorities, too, in trying to keep her secrets and in trying to shield her from scrutiny. And I don't know that that's necessarily, you know, a kind of something that only existed in the Belle Epoque, but I do think it's certainly something that fits into this kind of world where elites were very invested in sort of maintaining the the facade of respectability and propriety and had tremendous resources to do so. Curious about what's going on in Paris right now? My second podcast, Don't Miss This, 
takes you beyond the typical and the obvious with a weekly roundup of the best of what's happening in Paris each week. Never wonder what you're missing out on again. Listen now to Don't Miss This on ParisUndergroundRadio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. It's so interesting. And you talk a little bit in the book about how, like, historically in France, we had courtesans. And perhaps she was more like a courtesan because she also wielded a lot of political influence and maybe didn't do things for mm-hmm. but had the influence there. And yet she had much more freedom and independence and power than a courtesan would have had. So it does seem like she's nestled right into the right time period for her. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of that is her class station, that courtesans often came from very, very poor backgrounds. And, you know, she she sort of has this advantage that she immediately fits into high society because she is a member of this, you know, elite family that is very well connected. Yeah. And she's able to ask for money in the right ways without asking for money because she knows the codes. A hundred percent. So she she receives gifts from her lovers, you know, including cash. But she also, one of the major ways she structures her sex work is that if one of her clients wants to have an affair with her, they would have to buy her husband's paintings. So that then bolsters her husband's status as a sort of high society painter, um, but also means that she's not the one handling the financial transactions or would only be doing so on her behalf. She also has this like a sort of house outside Paris in Meudon where she entertains her lovers and her cook would come there. And when she was with a lover, her cook would present the lover with a very, very inflated bill for meals. And so that was another way of her making money um, is these sort of vast sums spent on meals that didn't certainly didn't cost what the, the man was spending. But that also meant that she was not handling the the cash. So she she really, I think, often knew how to ask people to give her gifts or to sort of suggest that she would be open to a gift. And that was something that allowed her to say, I'm not like one of these other lowly sex workers. I'm a proper woman of the bourgeoisie. And sometimes I have these friends who help me out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to ask you about the newspapers. So while she's going through this whole scandal, they're trying to solve the murders and and all of that. There are, I guess, four main daily newspapers that report just on crimes. To me, they sounded a bit like how I would imagine like the National Enquirer is today. Is that a bit how it was? Um, They, so those four newspapers, they, they certainly have a lot of reporting on crime and sort of scandalous things and exciting things, but they also were, you know, had the function of a kind of USA Today or even, you know, that they had serious reporting as well. They, one of them in particular, like Le Matin, would definitely saw itself as like having kind of serious reporting. And so they have a lot of content that's very troubling, but they also have a lot of, you know, sort of like, this is the debate over taxation content. Okay. It also seems like these newspapers are a product of their time and maybe like the true crime fanaticism that we have today is sort of embedded in this newspaper thing back then. Oh, a hundred percent. There was just a huge like vogue for, reporting on crimes. And Dominique Khalifa, an amazing French historian, has actually done like all, he did all these studies about, um, you know, like how the sort of the sections on crime just keep increasing, even in very sort of staid newspapers that are not at all tabloidy. And so there's just, you know, everyone just wants these sort of stories about crimes um, they also want stories that have a little bit of political intrigue and stories about sex and sexy women and celebrities. And so, you know, she is right in that the middle of that Venn diagram. And so, you know, her story sells tremendously well. There were 79 uh, dailies in Paris alone at the time. Wow. Right. And so um, it was an intensely competitive market, which meant that there was so much pressure to land a good story 
And she was a great story. And she would, there were a lot of times she would talk to reporters and make the story even better and kind of even more, you know, shocking. Yeah, she definitely was great fodder for tabloids. Yes, 100%. I think certainly there were times when the press loved her because, you know, she would just sort of spill a ton of secrets or just create sort of dramatic events with her her kind of propensity for yeah, drama. So there are a few themes that emerge in your book, and I wanted to read a quote from you. I'm going to quote you to yourself. And uh, you say, this is one of the messages of the Senio affair, that heterosexual desire to find France. It was an inescapable element of the political system, of the courts, of high society, and of everyday life. Sure, it could lead to corruption, but at least its women were sexy and its men lusty. And this idea of France and France's virility and potency being tied to its men's virility and potency, if you will, seems so integrally linked. Whereas in a place like America, we want our leaders to be attractive, like a Kennedy or an Obama, but not sexy. We don't want them having affairs. And they're a bit more puritanical. Do you think it's the same today, the way that we view France or France views itself, like strong virile men equals a strong, healthy France? I think that there there certainly is that strain. And I drew a lot on a book by two French reporters, Sexist Politicus, which really makes that argument that sort of, I mean, it has a lot of gossip in it, but it really says that like, you know, politicians should be virile. And I think there was either they say it or a French politician said that, you know, sort of winning over voters was like seducing a woman. Right. That sort of that kind of magnetic sway was something that would give you political set, uh, success. And as you say, I was fascinated in this because as an American, it's a, a totally different. You know, we don't have that kind of notions. And I do think it's really fascinating in France that on the one hand, there's this like wide tolerance for politicians to have affairs or to have sort of, you know, unusual love lives. I think, you know. Uh, Macron would be an example, right? His his wife is much older. Francois Hollande, right, was sort of never married and had these sort of these girlfriends, right? But I think during his presidency, he like broke up with one and then started with another, right? These things would be so shocking in America are seen as sort of, you know, not a problem in France. But I also even think like, you know, taken as like, oh, well, you know, he got that woman, like, he must have something special going on. I think you're right. There's this idea of like, well, he's still got it. Men will be men. But also for women, Mm -hmm. women are allowed to have affairs too, because everybody loves sex. So you can't judge someone's character on what they like to do in the bedroom. Just so completely different than America. Absolutely. And I, I was just really fascinated by this. And the sort of notion that like politicians and presidents are at one hand given a lot of privacy, you know, that sort of after Full died, um, there were like hints in newspapers about how he died, but no one was going to come out and really say it, except for newspapers that were kind of like either on the far right or the far left and opposed the regime. But that at the same time, there was also this sort of like, he's so virile, like, look at how he died. Like, of course, you know, he he was such a lucky dog, which I thought was like really fascinating, that sort of duality of like on the one hand privacy, but on the other hand, like this actually kind of matters. It's very interesting. And I guess on the flip side of that, so Meg is in many ways shielded from this double murder that she's found in the heart of and maybe is an integral part of, who knows? Because she's from high society, but also, and perhaps mostly, because she's a woman and women are weak and hysterical and can't really be responsible for their actions if they're in a state of frenzy. So how much of how she was treated comes from, I guess this is an impossible question to separate, but how much of it comes from her being a woman? Oh, I think, trem- and also like an elite woman, right? I think the sort of the um, license given to elite women was really pretty 
pretty remarkable. So there's a great book by Edward Berenson, which I'm actually teaching part of tomorrow, on Henriette Caillou, who's a politician's wife who, you know, I think about sort of five years after the Stanel affair, goes into uh, a newspaper office and just shoots the newspaper editor dead because he had been publishing her husband's personal love letters. And she's acquitted. Yeah, she's acquitted uh, because the assumption is like, oh, she was just, you know, sort of off her rocker and all women are, you know, mentally ill. And so, you know, she just can't by legally, we can't find her guilty. Um, So there's actually a lot of information that we have that like women are increasingly found innocent over the course of the 19th century because the assumption was like they were all you know, sort of mentally ill. And it's fascinating because it's, it's on the one hand, this tremendously misogynist <laughs> idea. But on the other hand, it actually ends up benefiting certain women. She, I think, very much benefited from that. At the time, people thought that she had, um, she's acquitted of the murder. She's tried and then acquitted for the murders. People thought that she had seduced the members of the jury and that they couldn't resist her. There's a about six month period um, right after the murders where she's the only witness to them and the only survivor of the attack, but tells a series of really improbable lies. And, you know, the, the press and the public are just like, she's lying. Maybe she had something to do with it. Certainly she's hiding things. Um, but the authorities refuse to consider her as a suspect and are really trying to shield her from scrutiny. And one of the reasons is that the chief investigator was either one of her lovers or was like sort of an admirer. And so I think it's these sort of ideas about women's mental illness, but also this sort of idea about women's seductive capacities. And I I found like sources from the time that literally argue like, we're friends. We don't condemn beautiful women. Right. And it's just like, okay, all right. That's I love that part. I bookmarked so much of that. It's so fascinating. And one of the defenses that they put forth for her was that like if she was really in love and she did these because of an act of love, then of course she's fine. She can get away with it because love answer is the answer to everything. Exactly. It was, um, you know, and she's so emotional, like she was just lying to protect her daughter from sort of knowing the truth. You know, that that's sort of very clearly not true from what the evidence says. She was not a fantastic mother. And but I think there was just this sort of like, yeah, you know, if she's this loving woman, like she's emotional. She was just overcome with her emotions. And like, we can't convict her because that's sort of what women should be. But it's also like a sign of mental illness. <laughs> right, exactly. Women are naturally mentally ill. Right, exactly. <laughs> so as a, a final kind of question, I'm curious to know how far you think we've come. So if a woman like Meg existed today and she was a high society woman and we discovered that she's trading sex for favors for her family and then there are these double murders how likely do you think we as a society would be to forgive her today i think that is such a great question and it's something i've really thought about a lot so i think that one thing is that like i was really surprised at how beloved she was in many ways certainly not all the time but during the trial and then after And I think that, you know, sort of, we have a lot less tolerance and that women in the public eye are often much more vilified than she was. And so I think there are these ways in which, like, things are worse for us today. But I also think, you know, she would have had so many more options had she lived today. One of the reasons she stays married to this man she doesn't love um, because divorce was seen as scandalous. And it really, you know, like, it's not seen as scandalous anymore. It's seen as a, a personal decision. And so I think she would have had other professional paths open to her um, that she might have pursued as opposed to sex work. So I think there are a lot of ways in which her life would have turned out better. But I, I think there are other ways in which like her life might have turned out kind of worse if she were living now. Oh, that's very interesting. I had not considered that bit of it. Yeah, very interesting. 
Are you searching for spiritual guidance? The Heart of You podcast is an exploration into your soul through intuition, spirituality, divination, and unconditional love. Host Annette Lu is a spiritual guidance coach, intuitive, Akashic, and tarot reader who discusses practical ways to integrate spiritual growth into your everyday life. Listen now to The Heart of You on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. Well, I think it would be wonderful if we could hear a little bit from the book now. I would love to. So I'm going to read from the preface. And I chose that because that doesn't rely on any knowledge of anything that happens before, because it's right at the beginning. But it also is something that kind of sums up her life, both before the murders and then the murders and so going forward. So as the morning light shone through the large windows of her drawing room on M. Saint in Paris, Marguerite Senel, more commonly known as Meg, was surrounded by men. She was used to male attention and had received presidents, royalty, and many of France's most powerful men in this room. Usually, the men around her were paying her court, begging for the attention of this beautiful, charming woman. Usually, they were wealthy, urbane, and in search of a night or more of pleasure. Not this time, though. On the morning of May 31st, 1908, the men around her were dressed for a day of police work as opposed to a society event. They weren't engaging in witty, flirtatious banter, but besieging her with questions. What had she seen? What had she heard? What had she done? Meanwhile, she could hear the footsteps of other detectives searching for clues upstairs. One floor above, the corpse of her husband, Adolf, lay on the threshold between his bedroom and the bathroom. He was on his back, his knees bent underneath him, with a rope around his neck. In another room, Meg's mother's body was sprawled on her bed with her legs dangling off of it, her mouth stuffed with cotton wadding. A cord was also tied around her neck and her eyes were still open, staring blankly at the detective taking photographs of the crime scene. Meg was the only survivor of the attack and the only witness. The police wouldn't let her see the dead bodies, partly out of a sense of delicacy. Society women, like her, needed to be shielded from the harsher realities of life. Later that day, the two corpses were whisked away to the morgue for autopsies. She wouldn't get the chance to say a last goodbye. That morning, she was racked with fear and anxiety. How could she explain what had happened? She also remembered how she had been tied to a bed for much of the night. Her urine stains were still on the mattress, serving as a humiliating reminder of her powerlessness as she lay bound and had no choice but to relieve herself on the white sheets. A few years back, Meg had been one of the most powerful women in France. Money and jewelry flowed into her hands. That life seemed far away at the moment. Instead, an uncertain future awaited her. Rumor, suspicion, imprisonment, perhaps even a death sentence in the guillotine. Right now, though, she had to deal with a detective's questions. What did she know about how her husband and mother had been murdered? Was it a burglary gone wrong? A family feud? A jealous lover? Everything depended on how she explained what she had seen. Although the story she told that day strained belief, it was not as wild as the story of her life up to that point, and certainly nothing compared to what would happen to her in the coming months. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. So what's next for you? Can we expect another book? Uh, so that I, I'm not sure. So I, I'm sort of looking around for a project. There's some things I'm really curious about, but I certainly have not landed on anything in particular. So um, we'll see. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be hard to come up with another character as fascinating as her. So you're going to have to get some other sort of obsession. Yes. Is she, she sets a very high bar for... Yes. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. But it's a beautiful book. It's so well written and so well researched. And it reads like a really interesting story. So thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really did. I loved it. I loved it. I think I recapped the entire thing to my mom and then was like, and also you have to read it yourself. <laughs> That's amazing. So where can people find you if people want to keep up to date with what's going on in your world? How can they find you? 
Yeah. So um, the best way would be to go to my website, sarahehorowitz.com. And um, I have links to all my social media accounts. I am sort of on Twitter, on Instagram, and love to see people there. Fabulous. So I'll include links so that people can find you really easily. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. I feel like I could just keep talking to you forever. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. This was such a fun discussion. Thank you again to Sarah Horowitz for such a delightful conversation. You can find Sarah on Twitter at Sarah E. Horowitz, on Instagram at Sarah.E.Horowitz, and on her website at SarahEHorowitz.com. Please join me next week for a very special Halloween episode of Storytime in Paris, where I'll be speaking to an author from beyond the grave. Join our book club. The Storytime Book Club welcomes authors who have been featured on this podcast to come talk more in depth about their books. Since we keep the podcast spoiler free, this is the perfect chance to get all your specific questions answered. Our next guest will be season premiere guest Kate Reardon discussing her book, The Heat Wave. For more information, including sign up, please join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. You can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. Thank you for listening. And until next time, happy reading. This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.